So it's uh, indeed a uh, hunter uh, split. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Stephen Chu with us today. Uh, Stephen is a world renowned uh, expert in early universe cosmology, black hole physics, uh, quantum information. Um, but uh, and he, he is at uh, Michigan State since 2012, I think, before he was uh, uh, at the University of Oregon. Um, and uh, I think it's worthwhile to point out that uh, Stephen not, is not just a very successful physicist, but also a very successful entrepreneur in uh, biotechnology. And uh, uh, well, I think he's, he's, he's uh, very successful wherever he puts his, his finger in. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have him with us today. And uh, looking forward to your talk, Stephen. Please uh, pull up your slides. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let's see. So now I'm going to share my screen and select my desktop. And now if I go to present, you should, this should occupy the whole screen. Is that? Yes, we can see your whole screen. Thanks. Okay. So it's wonderful to be at virtually at the University of Sussex. Um, today I'm going to talk about quantum hair and black hole information. And I just want to say this is a rather specialized topic. So I am I, I welcome questions always in my talks. I, I enjoy answering questions, uh, but I doubly welcome questions here because this is a esoteric subject, and it's not a subject that most physicists have really uh, dived into. So there's no such thing, especially for students. There's no such thing as a stupid question or an elementary question. So just fire away. And keep in mind, I can't see you thanks to the wonderful Zoom, the way the Zoom app works. So uh, if you ask a question, the moderator or Xavier or somebody who notices it is just going to alert me to the question and I'll pause to hear the question. So, so please ask questions. The, uh, here are some references related to the talk. The talk is based on two preprints, which came out uh, in late 2021. The co-authors are Xavier Calme, your colleague, uh, Roberto Casadio uh, in Italy and um, Folkert Kuipers. I'm not say, I'm not sure I'm saying his name correctly, but uh, anyway, you, you'll all know him as well. So, Stephen, you can still only see your uh, title slides. Oh, it's not advancing. No, uh, not, not it is. Not it is. Thanks. Yeah. 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 That works. You're okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the author list is there, the two preprints are there. Um, if you have these slides, as I say, as a PDF, which uh, I'll make available, if you click that colloquium link, it will, that's a live link, and it'll go to some set of slides which are a more pedagogical introduction to the subject. So setting up the information paradox and also linking it to other things like entropy and quantum information. So I recommend if you get interested in this topic, uh, uh, but you find some of the discussion in this talk a little bit confusing, I would suggest going back to that colloquium. I also suggest two review articles. The older one is by Samir Matur, who is a string theorist uh, at Ohio State. And uh, he's been working on this problem for 30 plus years, and uh, or at least 20 plus years. And um, <clears throat> the review article he wrote in 2009 so that's 0909. Um, it has probably the best pedagogical introduction to the paradox and, and one of the cleanest formulations of the paradox, which has since become known uh, among experts as Matur's theorem, if you like. And so I recommend that. And I'll discuss Matur's formulation of the paradox in detail uh, in this talk. And the other review article, which is uh, coming out in Physics Reports, but was posted on the archive in uh, December of 2020, I believe, from that code number, um, is by Suvrat Raju, who is also an expert in this area, another person who's worked a lot on black holes. And um, his perspective is, I would say, complementary to what I'm going to say in the talk. So uh, I think we come to very similar conclusions. His perspective is a little bit more general. He's interested in the broader question of, in a theory with quantum gravity, in which you have gravity and also quantum mechanics, is it possible to localize information? Can you have the quantum information confined to some restricted region of space-time, or does it naturally, in a sense, spread so that it is uh, always recoverable even at the boundary of space-time? And as you listen to this talk, you'll see there are deep connections between uh, what we're doing and what Raju has done. This 
uh, approach that we're going to talk about today is a little bit more micro local. We're actually looking at the specific mechanisms uh, in the vicinity of the black hole that lead to this kind of spreading out of the information or recoverability of the information. But I, I recommend Raju's review article as, a, as an extremely up to date overview of the subject. So let me talk a little bit about this information paradox. It's been an open problem since Hawking proposed it in 1976. So I'm guessing a lot of people in this talk were not born in 1976, but that is when Hawking first formulated the paradox. And the paradox arises as soon as you have a general relativistic formulation of a black hole and then start to seriously consider the quantum matter fields. In so, that Stephen, Stephen, sorry for interrupting, but I, I think there's still something odd with the slides. Now we, now we see the right side, I think, yeah. Okay. I, will, I will remind me of this and I'll, 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 I think I just have to do it twice and then it works or something. Yeah. So okay. now we're on the black hole information paradox. I think that's where you, yeah, where you are, yes. right? Thank yeah. you, sorry about that. So, so as I mentioned, it's an open problem. It's been in existence for a long time. And in the little diagram at the bottom, I have the progression in our understanding of gravity itself. And you'll see it's in stage three when we start to think about quantum fields and curved space time, i.e. say uh, photon excitations propagating in a black hole background. Um, that's where Hawking did his initial calculations that we start to see a problem. But to resolve the problem, you have to go a little bit further. You have to actually consider the quantum states of the graviton fields. And that's what I'll be mainly focused on in this talk. But I want to emphasize nothing in this talk is speculative. Everything is using known physics. We are not invoking any new physics to resolve the paradox. We are just exploring in more sort of careful detail, uh, under, well understood physics concerned with uh, quantum gravity. So we don't require a full theory of quantum geometry to make progress here. Okay, uh, has the slide advanced? Nope. Yes, now it did. Great, okay. Um, this slide is describing something which is probably familiar to everyone, uh, the Schwarzschild solution. So that was the first black hole solution discovered really quite a long ago, over a century ago. It has a very simple form. The metric is written there. And it has some interesting features. For example, it has a horizon at r equals 2m. Throughout this talk, uh, except in one or two places, I will use natural units. So I'll use units where Newton's constant, the Planck length, h bar, and c are all equal to 1. And so if you look carefully at the Schwarzschild solution, you'll see that there is a horizon. That horizon is at r equals 2m. And the horizon is really in a sense defined by the effects it has on causality in this space time. And I'm gonna focus on that a little bit uh, for the next few slides because it's very uh, central to the formulation of the information paradox. Now, where were we? So we had introduced the Schwarzschild metric as a simple example of a black hole space time. Now, in classical general relativity, there are results called no hair theorems. And what they tell you is that only certain properties of the black hole are manifested in the external metric, external behavior of the space-time around the black hole. And the properties of the black hole that can be discerned through the properties of these classical solutions are things like its mass, its angular momentum, the various charges, uh, if, if, if the charges correspond to continuous symmetries, gauge symmetries, um, then they're reflected in the hair that the black hole has. And in the first part of this talk, what I'll discuss is uh, what happens when you take into account quantum gravitational effects and how they generate a kind of hair which violates uh, these no hair theorems. So information about what's inside the black hole is actually reflected in the quantum state of the gravitational field. And we call that quantum hair. So it's the quantum uh, counterpart to classical hair and it violates the classical no hair theorems. Okay, on this slide, uh, I have a picture of the causality of the black hole space time. And so as we all know, this forward light cone defines the set of points in space time which can be affected by the point at the uh, apex of the cone. 
And the main feature of a black hole space time is that the light cone itself tips over when you cross the horizon. So if you look at those little green uh, light cones on the right, you can see that uh, if, an, if the point that you're looking at is inside the horizon, which is, which is described by this sort of uh, pinkish cylinder, the moment you cross the cylinder, the entire forward light cone is inside and remains inside the cylinder. And what that means is every uh, observer that reaches the inside uh, region of that cylinder or inside the horizon, their future includes a singularity. No matter how they fire their rocket engines or navigate around, they will in the end hit the singularity. And so there's a, there's a, there's a disconnect causally between the interior of the black hole and the exterior of the black hole. Now, in order to, uh, in, in order to enable clear thinking about the causal structure of space-time, Penrose invented a set of diagrams, a, a way of visualizing uh, these space-times. And so this is an example of a Penrose diagram of an eternal black hole. So this is a black hole in which uh, you start with a star, the star collapses, uh, it eventually becomes dense enough that it causes the creation of a horizon. And the horizon is uh, described by this triangle. I don't know if you can see my pointer on the screen here. You can see your pointer, yes. Great. So this upper triangle is the interior of the black hole. The boundary of, at, which is at these 45 degree angles of this region is itself the horizon. And on the uh, diagram, light rays propagate at 45 degree angles. So if you start in the distance, distant past, so you could call it past null infinity. Light rays which come in, for example, and hit the star will travel as, I, as I'm moving the uh, pointer. Um, light rays that are heading into the future, for example, emitted by the star will travel this way and they'll reach future null infinity. And uh, the mystery place is this singularity where, uh, for example, in classical general relativity, you, you reach infinite density, energy density, no one really knows what happens here. We don't uh, have a theory of what's happening here that requires a full-blown theory of quantum gravity. Um, and the problem is that some degrees of freedom can go behind the horizon where they become causally disconnected from the rest of the universe and then they eventually vanish when they hit the singularity. So this is an example of the Penrose diagram of an eternal black hole. Now, at this point, uh, I believe Hawking, I believe these Penrose diagrams were invented before Hawking radiation was uh, discovered. So I think I'm following actually roughly the historical timeline here. Um, Hawking asked the question, let's allow some matter degrees of freedom, for example, the photon or an electron to fluctuate in the background of this uh, black hole space-time, say Schwarzschild space-time. And you, even though, the description I'm about to give is very cartoon-like. It does really capture the actual physics of Hawking radiation. So imagine you have an electron-positron or matter-antimatter vacuum fluctuation. So those vacuum fluctuations are happening everywhere in space-time at all times. And um, so imagine you fluctuate so that you have a particle and an antiparticle and it just so happens that that fluctuation happens close to the horizon. So one of the pair ends up falling in to the uh, past the horizon. So it ends up in the singularity. But then the other uh, part of the fluctuation doesn't pass the horizon and it's able to make it out to uh, positive null infinity, future null infinity. So that is actually the, at a really fundamental level, the quantum process that leads to Hawking radiation. You constantly have fluctuations near the horizon. Some of the energy and information can escape but also some of the information and energy are end up behind the horizon and they end up, it ends up causally disconnected from the rest of the universe. Now, a few facts about uh, Hawking radiation and black holes. The temperature of the black hole is proportional to one over its radius in Planck units, which is also proportional to one over its mass. So black holes have extremely low temperatures and this Hawking radiation process is extremely slow. And black holes have lifetimes proportional to m cubed, which uh, can easily be, for a macroscopic black hole, can easily be longer than the age of the universe. So in a way, this is a problem people did not get very concerned about because they thought, well, this is a very hypothetical problem because we'll never see any black holes evaporate. 
And so what if some information is destroyed in the process of black hole evaporation? So now post Hawking's formulation of the paradox, uh, it's useful to look at this version of a Penrose diagram, which describes not an eternal black hole, but a black hole which is actually evaporating and which eventually ceases to exist. So let me start by uh, looking at this uh, dotted line, which is labeled world line of an external observer. So uh, in these diagrams, space-like slices are generally uh, sort of horizontal. They connect this line out to one of these boundaries here. And so if you think of a particular slicing or particular coordinate system uh, uh, of this space-time, um, you can think of time as progressing forward uh, as I move my uh, pointer up along this dotted line. So at point A, the observer can see a star, and this, this black line can, could be, for example, a choice of uh, a space-like slice. Uh, it, and on the space-like slice, the points on this black line are meant to be simultaneous in that coordinate system. So. Uh, if observer A looks over at the star, he sees a star that has not yet collapsed to a black hole, um, but it maybe is in the process of collapsing to a black hole. As that observer moves forward in time, there will be a later point in his timeline in which he sees that a black hole is formed, he sees a horizon, and he sees Hawking radiation being radiated uh, away from the black hole that will eventually reach future null infinity. So point B is an observer looking at a black hole that has formed and looking at the Hawking radiation that goes to infinity. And point C, which is then in the future of point B, is a point after which the black hole has entirely evaporated. So now observer C, if you, if you make a space-like slice for him, uh, which could represent his moment in time, um, he does not see a black hole. The black hole has shrunk to zero radius and disappeared. Um, and from his perspective, um, the black hole formation and then evaporation was just some kind of uh, temporary event. You could, he, from his perspective, he could think of the black hole as some kind of metastable state that was created, it existed for a little while, but then it slowly leaked radiation, and eventually it's gone, okay? So um, this is a Penrose diagram of an, an evaporating black hole. Now you can already start to see the, the how the paradox is formulated here because this Hawking radiation is originating outside the horizon. In that cartoon diagram I showed you, you have a little fluctuation of a particle-antiparticle pair and one of the pair enters into the horizon, the other one goes off to infinity. But the point of origination of this radiation is outside the horizon. So it's causally disconnected from all the stuff that uh, has already fallen into the hole. And so what Hawking said in 1976 was that uh, the very existence of black holes um, necessitates a uh, violation of unitarity. And in particular, if, if you're used to this language from quantum formation theory or from foundations of quantum mechanics, black holes themselves can cause pure states to evolve into mixed states. So if you start the universe off in a pure state, the evolution which forms a black hole, which then later evaporates, leads to a mixed state uh, in the far future of the universe. And this is a very fundamental problem because pure states are not supposed to evolve into mixed states when you take the, the whole universe uh, into account. So that was quite a celebrated paradox, which people have been thinking about now for well over 40 years. And um, let me discuss a, a modern formulation of it. Again, I've repeated the same diagram here these blue lines are space-like space slices, so you can think of them as moments uh, in, in a time-like evolution. And um, in a modern formulation, uh, this is circa, this was first formulated maybe circa 1990s or so, um, it was useful to select certain slices in this foliation of the space-time and to choose one as a so-called nice slice. And the nice slice would have the following property that it would intersect most of the radiation generated by the black hole, but it would also intersect all of the matter that fell into the black hole. And because by the 90s, there was more information, there was more in interest in quantum information theory, uh, people were aware of something called the no cloning theorem. The no cloning theorem, which is a just a simple result in basic quantum mechanics, says that information, quantum information cannot be present in two 
space-like separated regions at the same time. And so for the information to have fallen into the black hole, but also to be encoded somehow in the Hawking radiation, which is escapes, would be a violation of the no cloning theorem applied to the quantum state on that nice slice. So that, that's a kind of uh, modern formulation uh, of the paradox, uh, which originated, I think, around the 1990s. Okay. So what is what are the weaknesses of these formulations? So you'll notice everything I've done so far um, is in, the, in that evolution of theories from Newtonian gravity to general relativity to quantum fields propagating in a fixed background space time to a full blown theory of quantum geometry. All of these formulations live in level three of that diagram. They still require a fixed classical background geometry. And then they ask questions about individual quantum fluctuations, typically of matter fields in that background geometry. Now, you could go a little further and you could consider fluctuations of a spin two degree of freedom, which is the graviton in the background geometry, but that doesn't actually change the, the, the Hawking information paradox at all. What you really need to do to go further is to actually ask about the quantum state of the geometry itself, the quantum state of the background space time. And uh, this quantum hair, these quantum hair results, which I'm about to give now, uh, establish that the quantum state of the graviton field outside the horizon depends explicitly on the internal state of the black hole. There is in fact a link, despite the fact that in classical physics, there is a very uh, explicit, uh, one can divide the space time into causal regions. Once you consider a full quantum treatment of the space time itself, i.e. you treat, you, you ask about the quantum state of the graviton field, outside the black hole, you see that it is actually not true that uh, there is no causal link between the internal state of the black hole and what is happening outside with the gravitational field. Okay, so let me summarize the results of the first preprint. Uh, I think I have the right one there. It's the first, pre maybe I have the wrong number actually. So it, it, I think this should be 2110, not 2112, if I'm not mistaken. So I might have the wrong link there, but it's the, it's the first paper uh, that we wrote. And so let me just summarize the results and I'll go into it in more detail. So the first result is that if you ask about the asymptotic quantum state of the graviton field of a compact object, which is an energy eigenstate. So I, I wanna be very specific about the quantum state of the source, the, it's a compact object and it's an energy eigenstate. And then ask questions about the quantum state of the long range gravitational field, you can show that that long, the quantum state of that long range gravitational field is determined at leading order by the energy eigenvalue of the compact source. And this implies that if there are no accidental energy degeneracies of this comp compact matter source, then there is actually a one to one map between individual graviton states that are sourced by this compact uh, matter configuration and the internal states of the matter configuration itself. And furthermore, you can show that therefore a semi-classical matter source produces an entangled graviton state. And I'll go into these uh, results in more detail. Now, the second thing that's concluded in this paper is a particular example of a calculation in which we look at, we allow quantum gravitational fluctuations, i.e. we allow propagating gravitons to appear in loops. And we show that this produces corrections to the long range potential and they're corrections of order one over R to the five. So instead of a one over R to the potential, this is obviously a much weaker effect because it's due to quantum effects, but uh, it is there. And in fact, the coefficient of the one over R to the fifth term is itself dependent on the internal state of the source. So if we try different sources like a dust ball with this configuration and a dust ball with another configuration of energy density, we find different coefficients of the one over R to the fifth term. So this is an explicit example of how when you treat the gravitational field quantum mechanically, um, you can uh, produce a different quantum state. So there, there is a quantum state corresponding to this classical potential that's produced, a uh, quantum state of a graviton field. You get a different quantum state depending on the internal configuration uh, of the source. And so therefore it would encode some information about the internal state of the black hole. So these are the two main results. And let, let me go quickly through these results. So the first result concerns a compact matter source 
which is an energy eigen in an energy eigenstate, and it has energy eigenvalue E. Now, it turns out we can actually construct explicitly the graviton quantum state that corresponds uh, to a source uh, with specific energy E. Now, it turns out the construction is exactly analogous to the same construction that you would make in QED. So in quantum electrodynamics, if I have a source with charge capital Q, I can construct a coherent state which describes the photon field, which is in the, or the gauge field uh, configuration, which uh, results in the Coulomb potential. And it, so it turns out that's a, that's a well-known construction. In the formula one there that I've written, um, the vacuum state with Q equals zero is, it means the vacuum state of the gauge field in the presence of zero charge. On the left-hand side, you have the vacuum state of the gauge potential or the photon field when there is a charge capital Q present. And you can write the thing on the left in terms of a coherent state built from the vacuum on the right. And the things which appear in the coherent state construction are Q, the total amount of charge involved. Little Q of K is a Fourier transform of the Coulomb potential. And B of K is a linear combination of annihilation operators of the photon field of the gauge potential, but the non-propagating components of the gauge potential. So depending on what gauge you're in, it could be the temporal, some linear combination of the temporal and longitudinal components of the vector potential. So this is a known construction uh, for uh, QED, for a U1 gauge theory. Now it turns out the exact same result implies, applies in gravity. It's just that you have to shift, you have to change the uh, symbol capital Q to be capital E, the actual energy of the compact source. And it turns out one can actually derive these results. The standard way to derive these results is constrained quantization, where the Gauss law is a constraint on the quantization. And so when you quantize the gauge theory, the Gauss law forces some degrees of some modes to be non-propagating, and then you can construct the vacuum in terms of those modes, the vacuum of the photon field. And you can do the same thing in a canonical quantization of gravity. Recently, people have been interested in something called the double copy relationship, which relates the perturbative or tree level properties of gravity to uh, QED, to a U1 gauge theory. And that mapping also maps the coherent state that I showed on the previous slide to a coherent state of gravitons. So um, again, this is somewhat esoteric information. I think most physicists are not particularly concerned about this. The main point that I'm trying to get across here, though, is that we, we do know what the quantum state of the external gravitational field sourced by a particular quantum state with energy E. And the main point of it, the, the main logical point that we're going to use in the rest of the talk is that if I change the energy E of the source, the matter source slightly, it inevitably changes the quantum state of the long range gravitational field that is sourced uh, by that compact matter object. Okay, so that is the most important thing. So each psi G of E I've written is that notation means that I'm looking at the quantum state of the gravitational field, that's psi sub G, and the argument E is meant to uh, remind us that it depends on the specific energy eigenvalue of the thing which is sourcing the field. Each distinct energy eigenstate of the compact source has a different graviton quantum state, and we can write it down explicitly. So now let's return to a semi-classical matter configuration like uh, a neutron star or a, bl a, a blob of rock or something like this. Um, Typically, when we encounter a macroscopic object like that, it's not in an exact energy eigenstate. So a semi-classical object is typically a superposition of energy states with support concentrated in some band of energy. So, so, there's, so we, we don't know its energy exactly, but we know it's uh, you know, in some range you know, to some tiny fraction of an electron volt or something. So a typical, if, if we wanted to write the most precise and realistic description of a compact source that we might encounter in the universe, we would write it as a superposition with some coefficient C sub n of some energy eigenstate psi sub n. But from the results that we just showed, then we can also write down the gravity field of the, gra the gravity, the, the state of the gravity field psi sub g of this realistic thing, which is itself a semi-classical matter configuration. And of course, it is just therefore then a superposition with the same coefficient Cn of these psi g 
of ENs that uh, we explored a few slides ago. So uh, this establishes that realistic objects, which are macroscopic that we encounter and which have gravitational fields, have uh, quantum states of their gravitational field, which are superpositions, and we can actually write down uh, what those uh, superposition states look like. Okay, so here I've got some drawings, which, question? No, okay. Uh, here I have some drawings which are meant to illustrate this. So probably as particle physicists, we're all familiar with the idea that you might have a, on the left-hand side, that's the figure on the left-hand side, you might have a baryon, which is composed of three quarks. And suppose I want to probe that baryon with a long wavelength photon. So I want to know what is the long range Coulomb field of this baryon. Well, we all know that this just depends, even though there's some really intricate structure inside the baryon, the quarks are doing funny stuff and there are maybe virtual particles in the gluonic field of the quarks and they're interacting dynamically. Nevertheless, the long range photon field is just determined by the total charge of all the stuff that's inside this baryon. And so if, if from an effective field theory perspective, it's not surprising that the quantum state of the photon field that corresponds to the baryon source is just determined at leading order by the total charge of the baryon. Now, the black hole or gravitational counterpart of that observation is that if I probe an object, so that funny looking cylinder on the right is supposed to be some compact matter source and, and time is uh, moving in the upward direction. Um, if I probe uh, this matter source with a long wavelength graviton, which is uh, represented by H mu nu here, um, this graviton is going to couple to something which is a collective property of uh, this compact object. And it turns out that collective property we've just demonstrated is its, its energy eigenvalue. So, so if this compact object is in an energy eigenstate, the gravitational state is determined by the energy eigenvalue. And if this thing is a semi-classical object, so it, has, it is a superposition of some very close together energy eigenstates, uh, then the resulting gravitational field will be this thing that I've indicated at the bottom here, which is a superposition of specific uh, uh, gravitational states psi sub g with coefficient c sub n, where these c sub n's are drawn from the specific semi-classical state describing the compact object. So that's, that's a summary, that's an explanation of conclusion one uh, that I gave a few slides ago. Let me talk about conclusion two now. So in conclusion two, we uh, claim to uh, find one over R to the fifth corrections to the long range gravitational potential of a compact object. Now, how, would, how did we find these results? So there's a very long history uh, uh, of an area in which people try to understand the effective field theory of one loop quantum gravity. So it's gravity, but I allow the graviton itself to propagate. I even take into account loops of gravitons. And you can imagine there's some essential non-locality if I allow, remember gravitons are massless, so I'm allowing massless particles to propagate and I'm trying to compute an effective field theory that results from those massless degrees of freedom. And of course, you would expect that it, it, it is going to have a non-local component. So this effective Lagrangian has a local component, which has the standard Einstein action, but then it has corrections which uh, involve higher powers of the uh, Riemann tensor. And then there's also a non-local part, which uh, is it's non-local because of that box operator. And what is interesting is that starting, I don't know the exact history, but maybe all the way back in the 80s, people were interested in computing this object, the effective Lagrangian due to one loop graviton effects. And while the, I think the technical calculations to produce this effective action were done really some time ago, like in the 80s and 90s, the understanding of how to actually apply this effective Lagrangian to get physical results is relatively recent. It's something Xavier and his collaborators have been working on, I, I think, five or 10 years now. And the reason it's subtle is because, for example, the coefficients C1, C2, C3, alpha, beta, gamma, um, these all have explicit dependencies on renormalization scale, mu. It's also true that uh, the coefficients ci, for example, depend on ultraviolet physics. So to, to really know what these coefficients are, you need to understand what the UV completion of quantum gravity is, i.e. is it string theory or something like this. So 
um, there are many technical details that have to be solved in order to apply these results. But Xavier and his collaborators have managed to do this and, and they get results. One sanity check on any of the results that you obtain from this kind of effective Lagrangian is that all the mu dependence actually cancels. And in fact, that's the case. So, so I think that we now know how to apply uh, this particular effective Lagrangian to deduce some physical uh, effects, like what is the effect of uh, graviton, uh, virtual graviton loops on the long range uh, potential of a compact object. So that, that's the question that we're interested in now. Now, how exactly do you apply this one loop effective Lagrangian? So the effective Lagrangian leads to modified Einstein equations. So you get slightly di somewhat different Einstein equations you can start with a classical metric like the Schwarzschild metric, and then you can uh, use perturbation theory, expanding in things like R much larger than the Planck length and R much larger than the gravitational radius of the compact source. And in that expansion, you can self-consistently solve for the leading order corrections to the Schwarzschild metric. And the leading order corrections, which are found, as I said earlier, are one over R to the fifth corrections to the potential that you would get uh, from just, uh, say, Newtonian gravity or from the Schwarzschild metric. And what's interesting is when you do this calculation, it depends explicitly on the internal configuration of the compact source. So if you have a different density profile of the compact source, uh, you end up with a different coefficient of r to the minus 5. And so this is an example, again, of if you start to take into account the fact that the, the metric that is sourced by the compact object is itself quantum mechanical, in this case, it's affected by virtual uh, propagating gravitons, um, you start to see that there is actual information about the interior of the compact object, which is encoded in the quantum state of the exterior. Now, in this case, what was found, because it's a semi-classical, it's an effective field theory calculation, what you find is a correction to the potential one over r to the fifth. But that modified space-time or that modified potential is it, does itself correspond to some underlying quantum state. There's actually some quantum state that gives you that one over r to the fifth uh, correction. And that quantum state obviously is different depending on what internal configuration of the source you choose. So it's, it's very similar in logic to the earlier point that the uh, quantum state of the long range gravitational field is a function of the, the quantum internal quantum state of the compact object. Okay, so that logical point that outside the horizon of the black hole, if uh, in the quantum state of the gravity field is encoded some information about the interior. That is the main logical step that you have to make. And from that logical step, then you can start to make some progress on the black hole information problem. So now I'm going to return to the black hole information problem. And what we're going to do is try to formulate as explicitly and as carefully as we can the process of Hawking radiation. And our main uh, our main challenge here is just to make things very explicit and clear. It's actually not conceptually dif difficult to go through all these steps. It's just that we have to just be very clear about the notation. Uh, and then once we do, then we get some very interesting results just from uh, pushing things forward in a very pedestrian way. So let's assume that I have a black hole and it's evaporating. It's a big semi-classical black hole. It's evaporating very slowly and emits one quantum at a time. And um, you know, there's a very long time uh, between each emission while the black hole is large. And uh, let's suppose in the total lifetime of the black hole, it emits a total of n radiation quanta. Now, these results are slightly unrealistic because a black hole evaporating doesn't always uh, emit exactly n quanta and then vanish. It, it might emit n plus two or, or n plus five or something. But just for the sake of notational <laughs> simplicity, let's assume it only emits exactly n quanta. And furthermore, each of these R1, R2, R3, R sub n are meant to represent the state of an individual quantum that's been emitted. And uh, that has to stand in for a whole bunch of quantum numbers representing the actual state of this, this uh, particle that's been emitted. It could be a photon, it could be a lepton, it could be a quark. Um, it will have the i mode, which is emitted, will have an energy delta sub i, it'll have a momentum p sub i, it has a spin s sub i, it has a charge q sub i. So all of those 
things are subsumed in the symbol R sub i. So R sub i is a stand-in for all of that information. But just to keep the equations uh, tractable, we, we just uh, use R sub i as a shorthand. Now, the new physics here, uh, based on the earlier observations we made, is that the amplitude for the emission, so the amplitudes here in our notation are given by alpha, the amplitude to emit a particular quantum R sub i in a particular state with energy delta i, momentum p sub i, et cetera, is itself a function both of the state of the quantum that's emitted and of the gravitational state outside the black hole, which itself depends on the energy of the black hole. So, so implicitly, alpha can depend on psi g of e, and I've just written its dependence as, as e there. So e is also a stand-in for all the different quantum numbers which describe the black hole and which in turn affect the quantum state of the gravitational field. And remember the fluctuations of say the photon field which lead to Hawking radiation are happening in the background of this gravitational state. So there's no reason to think that this gravitational state can't affect the amplitude. And we've simply written the symbol E to uh, reflect its potential dependence on that quantum state. So the, the amplitude is written as alpha of E comma Ri. And at leading order, we know what this alpha is. It's the result of the Hawking calculation. And at leading order, it actually doesn't care uh, because Hawking's calculation is semi-classical. It doesn't actually care about anything except some kind of crude measure of the mass of the, essentially the mass of the black hole and these original classical types of quantum hair that we knew about. But it, it doesn't depend in detail on the properties of psi g of e. However, we know it can. And we know that at subleading orders, so corrections to the Hawking amplitudes, we do expect that dependence to be there. Okay, so um, I think I've sort of just said what was meant to be on the slide. So um, in the leading approximation, you just get thermal emission, which is the Hawking result. But we expect subleading orders. So if you ask how good is the approximation that Hawking used to, to compute? His, uh, his results for Hawking radiation. We expect corrections which go like one over the, you can either say the entropy of the black hole to some power or the mass of the black hole to some negative power. Um, those would be the perturbative corrections. And then there are even non-perturbative corrections which are exponential in uh, negative S, um, which are expected to be there as well. So it's not a speculative, leap to say that alpha contains some dependences on E or psi g of E, but uh, they have not really been fully computed uh, at this moment. So we're just leaving it as a, as a completely general thing, which is parameterized by this function alpha. Um, the fact that these corrections can are linked back to the internal state of the whole is a consequence of the quantum hair. So the quantum hair says that the, the place where the uh, photon fluctuation is happening that leads to Hawking radiation, that place, uh, the quantum state of the geometry in that region is itself sensitive to the internal state of the hair. That, that's the main logical step that uh, allows alpha to do something interesting. Um, point three is somewhat technical. It's for uh, experts uh, uh, in this subject. It's basically an observation that even if you had the smallest uh, quantum corrections appearing in alpha e to the minus s. Um, the Hilbert space is so large that in which this uh, evaporation is occurring that it's been shown that actually even little corrections of that size can unitarize the result, can change a uh, what appears to be a um, mixed state density matrix back into a, a pure state density matrix. But I'm not going to go into detail with that. That's that's really for experts. Okay, so. Now, let me just walk through the evaporation of the black hole using the notation that we've just defined. So we start with some initial state. And here, we're, we're going to describe the exterior of the black hole. So um, we start with this semi-classical state, which we deduced earlier. So uh, g of e sub n just means the uh, quantum state of the gravitational field for an energy eigenstate with energy eigenstate e n. The compact object, or the black hole in this case, is assumed to be a superposition of different energy eigenstates with coefficient cn. And so that's the first term uh, that we start with here on the left. And then we just ask, suppose one quantum is admitted, one radiation quantum, which we call R1. We're going to sum over all possible R1 states that can be admitted. 
This CN is a carryover from the left-hand side. Um, this alpha is the amplitude for a system in a black hole with energy EN to emit a uh, radiation quantum labeled by R1. So this is that emission amplitude that we defined previously. And then the new state after the uh, quantum is emitted, the new state of the black hole exterior is a state which contains one radiation quantum R1, and it now is the gravitational state corresponding to a black hole, which has energy no longer En, but En minus delta 1. So, so uh, this one step is, if you think about it, every, every part of this, uh, right, going from this single sum to double sum is just standard quantum mechanics. And we're just uh, trying to keep track of all the things that are happening here. Okay. So remember, in this notation, little g refers to the exterior geometry, R1 refers to the radiation state. And so it, it's obvious that after the emission, you, you have the, the uh, radiation quantum now in the state, and then you have a modified gravitational wave function because the source has delta 1 less energy than it had before. Okay. Now, I can just repeat this uh, iteration. I can just iterate uh, this process again and again. So I can say, well, now let me emit a second quantum from the black hole. So in my pointer here, I'm circling now that this sum is over R, the states of R1 and the states of R2. The CN is still here. I have the original amplitude, but now I have the second amplitude, which is the amplitude for a slightly less energetic black hole energy eigenstate to emit the second quantum. That's what these amplitudes are. And then the resulting state that I have is the quantum states of the external gravity field, but where the source has now lost not just delta one, but actually delta one and delta plus delta two of energy. And uh, now in the in the in the external state, I have the state R1 and I have the state R2. And again, these delta ones and delta twos are stand-ins for all the different quantum numbers uh, that characterize R1 and R2. So it's also possible that this lost some, uh, the, the, the black hole lost some angular momentum, it lost some electric charge, it lost some color charge, et cetera. So, uh, this is just shorthand for all of those modifications, but the quantum state itself is a function of the depleted version of the black hole, which is reflected by this uh, minus delta one minus delta two. So you can just continue this process until you've emitted all of the quanta uh, going up to capital N. And so what do you end up with? You still have these linear factors of C sub N, which define the black hole uh, initial state. You have a product of all the amplitudes that were necessary to have emitted all capital N of the uh, Hawking quanta. And then at the end of the day, you no longer have a non-trivial gravitational field because there's no black hole left at the end. And all you have is the Hawking states R1, R2 through Rn, which are now propagating to future null infinity. Okay, so this was probably a little bit laborious for you that I went through this in such detail, but the point is that we can just using standard quantum mechanics, now write out the process of evaporation of the black hole. We started with a semi-classical black hole uh, defined here on the, on the upper left. And then at the end of the day, we end up with a bunch of quantum states, radiation states hitting out to infinity. And the exact state is written here. If we knew these functions alpha, uh, we would uh, have an explicit expression for the quantum state which is left after the black hole has fully evaporated. Okay, so I've just rewritten that final radiation state here at the top of this slide. Um, again, we emit reference to the geometry G in the final state because the black hole is gone and the space time is approximately flat. And uh, one interesting observation is this final radiation state is a complex superposition, but it depends linearly on the initial black hole state. So, I specify completely the initial black hole state when I give you these C sub n's. And these C sub n's fully determine, because these alphas are given uh, amplitudes, which are just compute, in principle computable from the known laws of physics. Um, so knowing Cn, the initial state of the black hole, tells you the Cn, which uh, specifies the final state of the Hawking radiation. So there really is a one-to-one -one map between the initial quantum state of the black hole and the final quantum state of the radiation state. And therefore, this whole process is unitary. I could time reverse this process. I could say, let's start with R1 through Rn as quanta that are coming in from infinity. 
And by reversing time, I can go back through all of these steps and end up with uh, these uh, radiation, radiation quanta feeding in uh, to a black hole, which grows as it absorbs these radiation quanta, and then it produces the original black hole uh, initial state. So that, that's a statement that uh, under unitary time evolution, everything is time reversible. Okay, and that's, that's what we find here in this description. Now, the, the most conceptually difficult part of this construction, I think for people to understand, uh, which I'll spend a little bit of time on here, um, and which is important for understanding how it is that we evaded the formulations of the paradox. So, so the, this description, very explicit description of how the evaporation works, has a hidden component in here, which is to some people very counterintuitive, which I'm gonna focus on. But once you understand that counterintuitive aspect of it, it's easy to see how we avoided the uh, formulations of the paradox. Okay, so each state in the Hilbert space, R1 through Rn, is a particular radiation pattern. So it describes say R1 was a photon and had a certain polarization and it went off in this direction. That was the first thing that came out. And then the second thing that came out was a positron and it had this spin uh, uh, polarization and it went off in that direction. And the third thing was a quark and et cetera. So, so R1 through Rn is, a, is, a, is, an, is an entire radiation pattern where some huge number of particles eventually uh, are, those are the things that the black hole actually evaporated into. And of course, I can have radically different radiation patterns. I could have, for example, the first three quanta went off in the plus x direction. But for some other choice of pattern, the first three quanta went off in the minus x direction. And if you study the recoil trajectory of the black hole, because energy and momentum are conserved, um, depending on where the radiation goes off from the black hole, the black hole itself recoils. And the, the physical trajectory, say, of the center of mass of the black hole can vary radically depending on which particular pattern, R1 through Rn, of uh, Hawking radiation one chooses. And in fact, if you count, there are, about, there are an exponentially large number of different trajectories that the black hole can take. And by the time the black hole has almost evaporated, the uncertainty in its center of mass coordinate is of order m squared. So it's actually much larger than the size of the original black hole. This is not surprising because the entire rest mass of this black hole is eventually going to be converted into radiation. And so any fluctuation in the pattern of the radiation will, can cause a non-trivial recoil where, where the black hole is moving you know, with velocity of order C eventually um, as it evaporates. Okay? So there are many different background space times which correspond actually to different Penrose diagrams. I mean, the, the, the internal coordinate transformations made to put something in the Penrose uh, form are different for different trajectories, evaporation trajectories of the black hole. And those are all corresponding to particular choices of the R1 through Rn uh, in these radiation patterns. So just by showing you the final state, which is the superposition of all the different possible R1 through Rns, I have by implication showed you that the space times involved in this evaporation process are themselves a huge macroscopic superposition state. And there's, there's actually just no avoiding that, right? Because, because there's so many different possible things that can happen in the radiation. There are therefore many different things that can happen in the recoil trajectory of the black hole. And therefore the actual space times that we're talking about are various. They're, they're, they're an exponentially large number of them. And we must end up in a superposition state of all of those uh, different possibilities. So, Let's now come back and look at, I mentioned the, something called Mathur's theorem. And I think this is the most kind of clear and pedagogical formulation of the paradox. Um, it goes back to about 2009. And what I wanna show is that the observation I just made about entanglement of macroscopically different space times being a necessary consequence of the evaporation of the black hole Manage to, manages to evade the Matur theorem. It manages to evade the entanglement paradox. So what Matur said was, let's imagine that you're falling in uh, to this huge black hole. And so the horizon is, you know, a thousand kilometers uh, in radius and the tidal forces are negligible. And as you fall past the horizon, 
um, and you just look and make a bunch of measurements on the vacuum, you must basically find in your reference frame, because you're freely falling, you must find just the standard vacuum state of, uh, say, the photon field and the electron field and all the other matter fields. And so it must be the case that the entanglement between the different fluctuations here, one of which becomes a Hawking radiation and the other one becomes a mode that falls into the black hole, the, the actual quantum state of those initial modes is, is just that of the standard vacuum, uh, standard model vacuum, and you can write down what it is. And very schematically, it has this form where a particular state of the mode E1, which falls into the black hole, is always correlated entangled with a particular state of the mode B1, which makes it out of the black, which, which doesn't go behind the horizon and makes it out to infinity. So there is this entanglement always present between different possible uh, modes of the vacuum fluctuations, which eventually, half of which eventually become the Hawking radiation. And so in, pr in principle, you could think of this as like, okay, if it's an electron positron pair, when the electron is spin up, the positron is spin down. And when the electron is spin up, the positron is spin down. So, so that, that can be, here we're being very schematic with zeros and ones, but, but the, the quantum states of these degrees of freedom, one of which becomes a Hawking radiation, one of which becomes uh, something that fell into the black hole, are themselves tightly entangled. And there's no avoiding that. It, just, not, just using the equivalence principle, as you fall through the black hole, you have to look at the vacuum state and see the normal vacuum state. So that, that was Matur's observation. Now, again, the notation is the following. His B modes are modes which make it out to infinity. So we would call those R modes. Those are the Hawking radiation. And E modes are the ones that fall in. And those are the ones that, those actually have negative energy. And those are the ones that cause the black hole to lose delta one of energy and delta two of energy and delta three of energy. So now, if I try to describe in this schematic language the full evaporation of black hole, I, I can start by looking at the very first Hawking quantum that comes out. And that very first Hawking quantum is this mode B1. And it has to have begun in this state. So it has to have begun in this kind of vacuum state. And if I allow B1 to make it infinity, to infinity, whereas I lose track of E1, E1 hits the singularity, and eventually I have to trace over E1 in a description of the universe after the black hole is gone, then Matur points out that, well, the entanglement entropy, the entanglement entropy is what you get when you consider the B modes and you trace over the E modes. The entanglement entropy must have gone up by log of two. There's just no avoiding it. Okay, so that, that's the, the kernel of his formulation of the paradox. And we can continue in this way. So because there's a long time gap between when the first uh, Hawking quantum is emitted and when the second quantum is emitted, um, there's plenty of time for the vacuum to settle back down into its ground state. There might be another observer falling in who happens to pass the ground, pass the, the horizon region just as the second Hawking quantum is emitted and he can make a little measurement on the vacuum. And if the laws of uh, physics apply, then he should just see this vacuum state. And then uh, we should again have this highly entangled situation where one uh, one mode in this quantum fluctuation that uh, falls in is highly entangled with the other mode that uh, makes it out to infinity. And there's just no avoiding this schematic form uh, of the quantum state of the second quantum and of the nth quantum. And so if you reason this way, when you're, again, you're just really just using the equivalence principle that what would a freely falling observer see as he passes the horizon just as the nth quantum is emitted, you can't avoid uh, having this kind of uh, tensor product structure for what is going on. And this tensor product structure, when you compute the entanglement entropy of all the modes that made it to infinity, all the Hawking modes, which we would call R1 through Rn, and in uh, uh, Matur's notation would be B1 through Bn, he would say that you cannot avoid having an entanglement entropy, which is n log two by the end, okay? So at the end of the day, uh, the black hole evaporates completely. The B quanta make it to infinity. The E quanta are all gone. We don't know what happened to them until we, you know, have a full theory of quantum gravity. Um, however, it, it's it's inevitable that the entanglement entropy went up by n units. And his theorem, which I'm not doing full justice to, you should you should have to you have to read his paper to understand the theorem. He proves that small corrections to the Hawking evaporation cannot qualitatively changes results. So the entanglement entropy increase 
per quantum emitted still has to be close to log two, as long as any corrections to uh, Hawking evaporation, the whole process are subleading. So, so you get, instead of a log two increase per quantum emitted, you get log two minus epsilon. But as long as epsilon is much less than one, you cannot change the conclusion that somehow you destroyed a bunch of information and a pure state which had zero entanglement entropy uh, evolved into a final state which had an entanglement entropy of n log two. And that's called Matur's theorem. So now I, what I'm gonna do is reformulate Matur's analysis, but in our notation now, and taking into account the fact that we don't just have one geometry on which each of these Hawking quantum is produced. We have in parallel many different geometries. By the time say half of the Hawking quantum quanta have been emitted, you already have a very dazzling set of possible geometries, different trajectories where the black hole might have recoiled, recoiled more to the left or more to the right or more up or more down. And it, the black hole itself is actually random walking as each time it uh, emits a, a Hawking quantum, it sort of random walks a little bit. So in our description, and I'll come back to this, I'll, I'll show the formulas again, we have a uh, non-factorized description of the Hawking radiation, a non-factorized description of the macroscopic, super, the, the space-time geometry states um, that have to be superposed. And so it's quite different from this one. So in, in Matur's formulation and in every other formulation, I would claim of the black hole information problem, they look at a fixed space-time background, a specific Penrose diagram, and they neglect possible entanglement between that particular macroscopic space-time and another one in which the black hole is traveling on a different trajectory as it evaporates. So that, that is the key distinction. So I can make contact between Matur's formulation by simply recalling that his B modes are our R modes. His E modes, which are these negative energy parts of the vacuum fluctuation, which fall into the black hole and cause the black hole to lose energy delta, those are reflected in our analysis by E goes to E minus delta. So we don't explicitly write the E modes, but we, we keep track of the change in the internal state of the black hole, which is in his description are caused by these E modes. And in our notation, we just keep track of E minus delta, E minus delta one, E minus delta two. Uh, and we keep track of how the exterior metric state is modified by each of the absorptions of an E1 and E2 and E3 uh, little e1, little e2, little e3 modes uh, as the whole thing goes along. So his entangled state for the ith uh, Hawking quantum emission is of this form. In our case, if you look inside our giant formulas, you'll see something like this. Instead of e sub i, we have the external graviton state modified because the black hole energy shifted or the, the energy of a particular eigenstate was shifted downward by an energy delta, and delta is just the energy, the negative energy of uh, this mode E in the Matur formulation. So you can see that within our expressions are all of Matur's expressions. However, the key ingredient that we have in our expressions is we keep track of the entanglement across different macroscopic space times. We don't just pretend that there's one fixed Penrose diagram on which all of this is happening we actually keep track of entanglement between different uh, coordinate uh, uh, space times or metrics that are created uh, depending on the pattern of the Hawking radiation. So as I said, it's a little bit conceptually challenging. <laughs> Hopefully people ask questions if what I'm saying is not clear, but um, uh, this, is the, this is the crux of the matter for why the earlier information paradox formulations fail to apply uh, to the expressions that we've given. So um, this slide is just a repeat of a slide I showed earlier when I went kind of laboriously through each stage of evaporation of the black hole. And the main point is when you look at this final radiation state, let's, let's just look at this final expression, you'll see that, again, if you look carefully in the sum, you have expressions where um, there are entanglements between the ith mode of the Hawking state and the uh, particular decrease, for example, in energy uh, of the internal state of the black hole, uh, which is 
it re reflected this amplitude. So you can dig out all of the expressions that are in Matur's formulation from this giant sum, but you'll see there's a bunch of other stuff in this giant sum, which he doesn't consider. And all of the stuff that he doesn't consider is an entanglement between the uh, calculation he is doing on a space fixed space-time background and some other fixed space-time backgrounds, which could result for a different radiation pattern. And he neglects all possible entanglements between what he's looking at and some other things which he's not looking at because they, they don't actually occur because uh, they, they correspond to different patterns of the radiation coming off. So um, again, this might be a little bit uh, difficult to conceptually absorb, but this is the main claim that we're making that a correct description of what is happening in the black hole evaporation includes much more than what is current typically considered in the formulation of the paradox. And that's how that's why this unitary expression uh, manifestly unitary expression manages to evade the earlier formulations of the paradox. Okay, let me make one, I'm almost done. So uh, let me just make one comment, which is a little bit for the experts, uh, but pe for people who know something about quantum information theory, that this might be uh, interesting to them. So um, when people formulate the when historically, when people formulated the black hole paradox, they, as I as I keep emphasizing, they they generally focus on one fixed space time background, and then they they calculated, oh, there's this thermal Hawking radiation, and uh, it seems to seems to cause a pure state to evolve into a mixed state. Now, when you make that restriction to a fixed semi classical background, you're effectively restricting to a subset of possible radiation patterns R one through R n. There's only a, a a certain subset of radiation patterns which when you coarse grain them, they're consistent with a recoil trajectory of the black hole that corresponds to any chosen fixed semi-classical background. And so by, by removing a whole bunch of your Hilbert space, you're down to a very small subset, which I'll call X, of the final state Hilbert space Y. So Y is everything. It's all the possible R1 through Rn uh, lists that you could write. But by choosing, by fixing the, cla the classical background, there's only some subset X of those uh, states R1 through Rn, which are consistent with that background that, you, that you've chosen, okay? Now, when you start with a pure state in a large Hilbert space, so Y is a very large Hilbert space, it's actually exponentially large in the mass of the black hole. If you take a large, a pure state in a large Hilbert space, and then you trace over most of the Hilbert space, leaving behind a density matrix, which is only valued on a small subset of the original Hilbert space. There's a theorem which relies on a property called concentration of measure, which is a property of high dimensional geometry. It says that this density matrix rho of X will be close to thermal. Okay, so, so if you start with a pure state, the, the state that you're looking at could be entirely pure, but when you trace over all these other degrees of freedom, you necessarily get a mixed state valued on X, which is a small subset, and that density matrix will be nearly thermal. It will look like thermal radiation, i.e. what the Hawking calculation shows. And so there is a connection between why it is so hard to get a handle uh, on the unitary evolution of black holes or the black hole information problem and this fundamental property called concentration of measure. This property of concentration of measure is actually behind all of quantum statistical mechanics. So all of it's been discovered in the last roughly 10 years that you can derive all properties of quantum statistical mechanics just from this one property of concentration of measure, which is itself a geometric property of high dimensional spheres, basically. So I just wanna make that connection. I realize it's a little bit esoteric for people who are not uh, experts in quantum information theory, but, but there is a deep connection between what's called concentration of measure and the black hole information problem. Okay. Um, this slide is a little bit redundant. It's just saying that, um, oh, I'm sorry, no, okay. So, so in, in, this, in this notation that I've defined where X is the small subspace of the total Hilbert space Y, um, in the full description, there is entanglement between X and uh, some other part of the Hilbert space X prime, which is another small subset. Um, however, when you eliminate that information, that's when you end up with a density matrix describing X. But if you, if you retain that information, uh, then you can see that you actually are describing a, a pure state in the larger Hilbert space Y. And again, we've just recopied 
I've just recopied our final state expression here. And you can see that in this final state expression, there are entanglements between what I call X and X prime in this uh, concentration measure discussion. So um, it is not factorizable. And in fact, the full state here is a pure state in Y, but uh, looking at it in any restricted subspace, X will always give you some kind of uh, quasi-thermal description. Okay, let me stop there and just give the conclusions. Uh, so the, the very elementary thing we pointed out right at the beginning was that these classical no hair theorems do not extend to the quantum realm. So if I start to probe the quantum state of the graviton field of a compact object or a black hole, I can see that it is actually carrying, that quantum state of the graviton field is carrying some information about the interior state. And we gave some examples of why that's true. Once that is true, you can start to try to describe the black hole evaporation very explicitly. And you can describe it in terms of unitary evolution, in terms of amplitudes that deviate just slightly, but in an expected way from the original Hawking semi-classical result. And so uh, paragraph one and paragraph two on the slide are sort of the positive uh, statements. So, so, so we notice there's quantum hair, then if we incorporate that quantum hair into uh, a very step-by-step -step description of evaporation, we end up with a unitary description of the evaporation, it looks fine. The only weird thing about it is that involves um, entanglements between very different space-time geometries, which correspond to very different uh, recoil trajectories of the black hole as it evaporates. But ultimately, it seems like that is unavoidable, that uh, if you have a superposition state of many different radiation patterns, you therefore, in the process of generating that radiation pattern, were at intermediate times in a superposition of many different uh, macroscopic space-time geometries. And it turns out that is important to understanding how it is that this solution evades the earlier formulations of the paradox. So let me stop there. And I hope everybody's with me. I hope I haven't been disconnected from the internet this whole time. <laughs> We're with you. Thank you a lot for this inspiring talk. Um, we have time for a few quick questions. Questions, uh, I think, uh, Jacob, please go ahead, uh, please. Um, actually, that was that was a clapping hand. That wasn't a raised hand. But um, let me just say it's a very interesting talk. I come from a, a quantum information um, background, and I uh, I found that very intriguing. I mean, this is this is a problem that um, I've heard a lot about, and um, I've heard of the frustrations people have had about it. So I think um, your take on it is very interesting, and I've, I'm I'm really going to have to get my head around this entanglement between different space time geometries. But I think it's a a really interesting way to look at it. So let me just make that comment, and I'll I'll hand over to others. Thanks. Any any questions? So me, yeah, we have, yeah. But we have one question here in the room. Nathan, please. Uh, uh, that was a really awesome talk. I sucked into it now, uh, but I have a more practical question. So I find it appealing that you come up with a solution that doesn't involve any new physics necessarily to describe black hole evaporation, but what I wonder is, could you ever measure this effect and how, I mean, what are the observables that could give credence to this approach? That, that is a great question. And I will point you to a paper I wrote about 10 years ago in which I asked the question, what kind of experiments would be required to detect, or sorry, to determine whether black hole evaporation is unitary? And as I studied that problem with one of my graduate students, I realized that actually it's very similar to the experimental requirements that you need to determine whether pure states evolve into mixed states under quantum measurement. So uh, probably you know, like uh, when, you, when you measure, say, the spin of an electron, you have to bring it to a measuring apparatus. And the measuring apparatus, uh, then through a process of decoherence, gets placed in a particular state depending on whether the spin of the electron was up or down, something like this. And, but you could ask the question of whether did the measuring apparatus actually get placed into two different, uh, was there actually a wave function collapse and non-unitary projection? So the, the, the way the measurement device state gets placed into a mixed state, or is there actually secretly a superposition of the two states of the measuring device 
and you, you're just only sensitive to one because you're a macroscopic observer. And you need that level of sensitivity to determine whether the black hole evaporation has been unitary or not, because you have to, you have to basically see like, did I get that other pattern of radiation, which caused a different recoil trajectory of the black hole? And do I have the proper phase relationships between those two different possible end states such that unitarity is preserved? And so of course it's, it's a very, this whole problem is very esoteric in the sense that it, I can't imagine a, a, a practical experimental way to determine whether black hole evaporation destroys quantum information or not. It's, it's, it, it, but it's, it's similar in difficulty to asking the question, do measurement devices actually collapse wave functions or do we actually evolve into a superposition state of the two measurement devices? And that gets to the most thorny controversial aspect of quantum foundations. Did that help? I, sorry if that, that wasn't uh, <laughs> a good answer to your question. Please follow up if, if that wasn't clear. Oh, that was great. Um, I think that pretty much gets to the point. Um, I was also thinking if there's information about the black hole interior and printed on the external gravitational field, could that possibly um, show up in a measurement of gravitational waves uh, with extreme precision, <laughs> say that there's something different about the gravitational waves than you expect? Well, I, um, I don't think it has practical consequences for say LIGO or, or real experiments on gravitational waves. You, one thing you did say though, uh, uh, reminds me that I, I neglected a whole part of this discussion in my presentation because we, we were, I was really presenting it from our point of view, the results that we obtained, Xavier and I and collaborators. But if you go and look at that Raju review article, which I mentioned at the beginning, which is a totally different perspective, that perspective is more related to something called holography. And so you may know that there are all, there's all kinds of evidence that um, gravitating systems, quantum gravity systems, which live in say D dimensions are dual to uh, boundary theories, which only live in D minus one dimensions. So there's something called the ADS CFT duality. Uh, it's an example of this. And Raju's perspective is, uh, maybe there's very something very special about the quantum nature of gravity, which forces information about what's in the, in the say behind the black hole horizon or in the bulk in general to also be encoded redundantly on the boundary of the space time. And in our language, in this talk, that would be psi G of E, that's the long range gravitational field corresponding to the compact source. In their language, which is more abstract, it, it has to do with whether measurements on the boundary of space time can recover all the information that's in the bulk of the space time. And so that's a, that's a different, completely different perspective on what I'm talking about, but it's essentially the same physical question. Like does information about the quantum state inside the black hole, is it doubly encoded in a sense in the quantum state of the gravity field far away? Um, and so that, that is the, the core of this matter. And, and there's a whole bunch of people, like if you knock on the door of any string theorist, they'll tell you, well, of course, we believe in holography. We have all these examples of ADS CFT. And of course, the information that fell into the black hole is, is redundantly encoded somehow at the boundary of space time. But the details of how this works is what we were focused on. It's like, what is actually going on as this black hole evaporates that allows it to do it in a unitary way? So maybe I could just make one comment. So the R correction to the emission of gravitational waves, that's something we calculated a few years ago. Uh, the effects are just too tiny to be observable uh, with LIGO, but there are corrections that depend on the internal structure indeed. All right. Um, due, due to a lack of time, we should probably wrap up. And uh, But first, we should thank uh, Stephen again. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Um, Thanks a lot, Steve. It was great. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I will stop the recording now and uh, see everybody. Uh, I think we don't have a seminar next week, but um, I will send invitations around. Anybody who is still interested to chat with uh, Stephen, please stay connected. Bye-bye.